Hello everybody, welcome to Sunday Night. I'm Dr. Bosworth and I do believe we're almost on time and I haven't had anything go wrong yet. So um, I am watching the comments um, uh, on the live stream tonight. So I would love to see that uh, A, you can hear me and B, uh, that you uh, can um, uh, tell me where you're from. Uh, and we're gonna get right into a couple of things that I'm really excited about. Um, Lachlan is our star patient for Sunday nights and is a type 1 diabetic. Uh, she's had some incredible breakthroughs the last couple of weeks and this week has uh, provided several wonderful teaching, <laughs> teachable moments. Uh, so I just want to say for those of you that are new to my channel, I'm an internal medicine physician and I am all about helping people um, with their uh, diabetes uh, as well as their health problems in the name of a ketogenic diet. So if, um, if you look at the, um, the so I've got a couple of pings that my sound is a little low, so if you can hear me, that would be great. If you uh, can give me a comment or, or two, um, I would love to, uh, let's see, let's get Blacklin off the screen for a second, get me turned on, <laughs> there we go. Um, so when I look at uh, the patient population that I've tried to collect, not only in my clinic, but also on this teachable classroom, um, I am looking for um, several of the, um, the, the chronic illnesses that come into a, an internal medicine physician. So um, tonight we're gonna talk a little bit about something that I haven't touched on before called gluconeogenesis. The reason we're touching on this is because of what's happening in Lachlan's life and some of her blood sugars and it's a really good thing um, it's a sign that her body is very much getting used to using ketones and that is amazing for a type 1 diabetic. So again, Lachlan is in her mid 30s and has had, um, mid to late 30s, <laughs> but has had um, diabetes for over 10 years. The type of diabetes that she has is type 1, which means she doesn't make any insulin. She'll never completely get off of insulin. and. Um, the, uh, the, the danger of um, having no insulin is that in medicine, we tend to over uh, provide insulin. Uh, we're all very afraid of them, um, you know, not having insulin and in a, uh, in a era gone by, we didn't have these resources to help patients with their diabetes. But in today's world, uh, we give far too much insulin and patients eat far too many carbohydrates for such a disease as having type 1 diabetes. Um, uh, I'm just going to do a little bit of bragging about uh, Lachlan. She has been on uh, this ketogenic journey for, this is our eighth consult, but it's about been about 10 weeks since she's been on this diet. Um, and I would say for her, for sure, it's a lifestyle change. One of the biggest motivators for her has been her son. Um, her son is in his um, um, you know, mid-teens and was struggling with his weight, um, but also was up against a surgery uh, and for a, a sports injury. And during that evaluation, we found that his sugar was high. Um, you know, would it be diagnosed as diabetes? If he was my son, I would be using those words, but uh, officially, that's uh, he didn't meet the criteria. So not only was this a uh, change of eating for a ketogenic diet great for Lachlan, it's been something that her family has um, been able to imprint. As parents, we, we model behavior and she has been able to uh, switch the foods in her home and has had you know over 20 pounds of weight loss in her son where he just is following the rules of what moms put forth in the, in the home. He still eats probably more than 20 carbs a day but has um, had such a shift in his metabolism that not only has there been incredible weight loss, which was needed, but um, as she's continued to check his sugar, his sugars have been very well controlled. So uh, I am going to bring Lachlan on uh, and pray this all works. There she is. Hi, Lachlan. Good evening. Hi. Uh, let's Hi. see if the world can hear you. <clears throat> um, I've gotten some good pings that the sound is working okay, so um, that is refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> so Lachlan, um, I had a few people ping back um, uh, the, the last uh, time we talked. You and I had gone to uh, your endocrinologist doctor together. So for those of you that don't know what an endocrinologist is, that's the specialist for diabetes. And um, she, uh, 
was they they asked questions about uh, have you have you ever had a physician go with you uh, to another doctor's visit? And although I know the answer, I thought I'd give you the chance to to, to talk about that. How how was that? Um. Well, because it was you, it's totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't know. You're just like an extension of me. <laughs> We're just taking the advanced education that you have, but um, I'll help you unpack it a little better, right? So, yes. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, they, I think there was some undertone saying, was there some animosity? And I'm like, oh no, the physician that's here in town is a very, he's a very well-respected physician and he's in our community and does a lot of great work. Um, I just think, you know, more looking through the life through Lackland's journey, which has been type one diabetes is it sucks. It's rotten. You don't ever get a break. It's always there. And um, teaching you how to have more freedom with your uh, ketogenic diet, um, with a ketogenic diet and being type 1 is what we're after. That there's the added benefit of your family members have, um, have had the kind of the consequences, but also the benefit of being your uh, offspring. <laughs> I tell, uh, I tell my pa my kids that uh, yes, you're you're destined to have to go to bed early, and you're destined to at least eat keto while you're in our home, and when you graduate, that's your problem. But I think maybe you have that same uh, curse for your kill your kids too. Right, right. It gave you a lot of great qualities. Unfortunately, blood sugar wasn't one of them. Right. Yes. Yeah. So you got he got type one as as you know in, in from you and in his dad's side. There's diabetes as well. So. Unfortunately, that's a double whammy. Yeah. So, um, as I look at uh, some of the um, some of the recaps from last week, uh, I just want to give everybody a, a few little point or a few little updates. Last week, Lacklin really was uh, able to improve her ketone production, as well as I, I really think last week was the first full week. Um, so that'd be two weeks ago now full week that her, I could say she was keto adapted, that as soon as she wouldn't eat for a while, her body would produce more ketones. And although we can get there pretty quickly in uh, people that are not type one, um, pushing somebody like Lachlan to, to be keto adapted in two to three weeks would put her at risk for dropping her blood sugars because we wouldn't drop her insulin as quickly as her body would keto adapt. We went much slower in Lachlan and we wanted to expose her body, specifically her blood brain barrier, to little ketones floating around her system. Um, I'm going to throw up a slide here. So if you're watching on the other, um, let's see here. Let's do keynote. Uh, we're going to go through your sh sugars in just a second, but I am going to show off uh, this slide right here. Um, all right. So this was the, the slide where I was talking about, you know, ketones having, um, um, having a, uh, you know, there's two fuels that go into our brain. Uh, the glucose is there and will be pulled in by a specific receptor. What was happening in Lackland's situation is she, her brain hadn't seen a ketone, these little blue ketones sitting there next to the brain. They hadn't seen a ketone in ages. I mean, maybe since she was diagnosed with uh, diabetes is the last time her system <laughs> saw a bunch of ketones. Um, and unfortunately, what happens there is um, the, the switching her to a ketogenic diet, the brain doesn't get to practice that. So the reason we wanted her brain to see those ketones over time is to get this little transporter that transports and pushes ketones into the brain. We wanted that to wake up because um, uh, that's where when people say, oh, I don't want that ketogenic diet. I don't, wanna, um, I don't want to have uh, the keto flu or I really don't like the slump that happens to my brain when I go keto. And the truth is, that's real. Um, the reason they have the slump that uh, is difficult to go from burning sugar in their bodies to burning ketones is this little transporter at the blood-brain barrier is sleeping or hibernating or dormant. It's just not been in practice. So in Lackland's case, um, we did some teaching last week about um, just remembering that the more uh, the key, the higher the ketone exposure at the blood-brain barrier, the more the brain would prefer to use ketones over time. The lower the blood sugar gets um, 
uh, I mean, the more the ketones were available, the more the brain would prefer ketones over glucose. And um, for all those providers and med students out there, um, we were all taught in medical school that the brain prefers glucose, the brain prefers glucose. But um, uh, this study that's quoted in this um, this uh, slide here is one measuring to see that we can actually calculate um, the, the longer and higher we expose brain the brain to those ketones, the better we can see that transporter using ketones. And when we tag that um, molecule, we can see that their brains uh, take up the, the glucose uh, more than, uh, or in, in preference to the glucose. They, 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 excuse me, they take up the ketone in preference to the glucose. So it's a really big deal. It sounds like nothing, uh, but that's one of the cases where I said, if you're new to the ketogenic diet or if you've fallen off the wagon, um, this, is the, this is the supplement that I told uh, Lachlan uh, that she was going to take twice a day for the first two weeks of this ketogenic diet. She did a great job, and then she started checking her ketones and would say, yep, uh, they're doing really good when I take the supplement. Uh, and then she was finding that they were present in the mornings. And last week was one of the times where, I'm going to put you back on, uh, Lachlan. So actually, you might want to mute uh, the, the cell phone. Can you hear me on your cell phone as well as that, or just on one? No, yeah, just one. OK, good. So when it comes to. Uh, the ketogenic diet, uh, this tipping point that happened last week, I don't know that I explained very well. But I had a few people come back saying, I don't know what was so exciting about her transition. And the key thing was that I could tell you were keto adapted because of what your numbers were doing. And even though it, <laughs> it took you three weeks uh, longer than it would have taken most people, uh, what we were really worried about was the, um, the lack of uh, uh, lows. Uh, we were trying to not overshoot your insulin, step down the insulin at the rate your body was starting to become keto adapted. And I think that's really the key when, I, when we talk about type 1 diabetes and can you be ketogenic, it has everything to do with matching the keto adaption to the, um, to the insulin. So in your case, we used um, a, f a few things that I've been watching. Uh, one of them we call the Dr. Boz ratio, but looking at both blood ketones and blood, um, uh, uh, blood glucose at the same time. So I want you, um, let's see, I want you to tell people about this slide here. So I hope you can see this. Um, Let's see, we're gonna take that one away and go down to, here we go. All right, so this is a list of Lackland's numbers through this week. Um, so I um, I have that up there. I think you can see that on your phone now, right, Lackland? Um, probably in a couple seconds, okay. it's a little bit delayed. So I, <laughs> I'm gonna walk, th I'll walk through it and then you can pick up when you can see it because I want you to tell folks about it. What we did this week is this is, um, um, this is the glucose uh, and ketones from this past week. So Monday was March 11th and um, the uh, March, uh, March 11th, she was down to 38 units of insulin. As 38 units of insulin, it sounds like a lot to the rest of the world out there. That's amazing for, for Lackland. We started out with over somewhere between 50 and 60 units of long acting, plus probably 12 to 15 units of short acting in a day. It might've been more than that actually. Um, way more. Was it way more? <laughs> okay, yeah. so I've actually said over 80 units of insulin when we started. Do you think that's a, still a fair assessment? Yep. Okay, so to be down to 38 units is amazing. Um, before I let you kind of rift on that, you can maybe, um, can you see the numbers now? Yeah. Okay. So why don't you tell folks about the, just, um, that was Monday morning and just tell about the, the first three or four days of this and then your frustration of what happened in this week. <laughs> um, so Monday morning, my numbers were decent, I thought, and then I went on my day and I didn't eat any sugar and behaved and drank my ketones and um did that and then the next morning I woke up with that 260 and I was pissed <laughs> right you were so mad you're like what <laughs> like I was mad right I was really really mad and then another bad blood sugar like 
the two hundreds I get really upset with. Right. So, and, so and again, and I was like, I didn't even deserve it. Like I didn't do anything. I've been like being Have I <coughs> right, not did at all. Like I'm, I don't deserve this 200. <laughs> Why? Right. So that column that has the empty column is supposed to be filled with your food log, but I didn't get time to type it all in yet. So um, uh, you wrote it down and I didn't quite get it in there. Um, but they were great. Your, your eating was really good. You had, I mean, probably less than 20 carbs a day. You really were doing amazing. And I just want the audience to point out that, um, you know, those uh, ketones aren't, uh, that, that, that's a really big part of this story that we're going to tell today. So just take a careful look that, you know, 0 0.4 is in ketosis. That's, that's not an accident, especially in a type 1. You know, if you would have checked her blood ketones a year or, you know, even Two, three months ago, it would have been 0, 0.0, 0, 0.0. So even though there's some low ones of 0 0.2 and 0 0.3, um, the 0 0.7, again, not an accident. That is absolutely, there is, uh, there's a metabolic reason that this is happening. We're going to go through that. Um, and so I want, so as the sugars go up, uh, the first day I said, well, before we raise the, sh the insulin back up, let's just stay the course one more day. And then you woke up the next morning, and although it wasn't 260, it was still 230, 234. Um, but your ketones were healthy. They were good. They were at that 0.7 and 0.5. And, um, and then if you look at, um, you know, the, the next steps in the week, that's the part that I am uh, very, very thankful. I'm going to put you back on. So if you, uh, if, so just take a guess, because I, I haven't done a great job of, even though we have a fun thing that we got to share at the end of the week, we're going to make sure to talk about, um, tell me what, um, tell me what you think was going on, because, I mean, you're really frustrated. I, I would have loved to have recorded how frustrated you were, <laughs> but, um, can, can... um, it's like nature's way of saying, girl, you don't want to do this no more, you yeah. know? <laughs> Um, no, I have no idea what was going on. I think, I think from what I understood from you that I have a lot of blood or a lot of sugar still floating around in there. Mm. So that's where we're going to go with this. So I am going to, now you'll be able to see this on the other screen, but I'm going to put, um, these slides back up. Uh, let's see. I think I'm going to do that anyway. Uh, so we're going to put the keynote on, take this off and go through a couple things. All right. So. I'm going to use a couple little drawings here to make this a little easier for folks to understand. Uh, so you're going to see these little drawings throughout um, the next couple of slides. These are my glucose guys <clears throat> on purpose. They have one guy that's kind of happy because glucose makes us feel happy. Uh, but it also is... Um, it, it is uh, followed by somebody who's kind of tired and even somebody who's kind of passed out there. Uh, so that is on purpose that I did that. <laughs> <laughs> when, when you look at the next slide, though, um, these are the what I call the ketone guys. And these guys are, again, they're an energy that is much longer. All of them are happy. All of them have a solid energy. Um, if they get too many of them around, we can have a problem, but it takes a lot of them for us to have a problem. Um, I, I threw up uh, some of the labs that we have checked from Lachlan, and I just wanted to show everybody, you know, as much as a 260 sounds like um, a really high sugar, um, going back even, um, you know, if we go back to 2017, her average sugar was 283. Uh, we know that by looking at something called a hemoglobin A1C. And that hemoglobin is a bunch of blood cells. And when the blood cells have been exposed to sugar for too long, uh, the, the sugar kind of sticks to them and it, it, it kind of hemolyzes, uh, it, it oxidizes uh, next to the, you know, into the red blood cell lining. And that makes the red blood cell not functional. So once the sugar is stuck to the red blood cell, it's gonna be there until that red blood cell dies. Uh, the red blood cell is 100 days, 90 to 100 days. So we check this about every three months, knowing that um, you know a new crop of blood cells will be available. Um, I tell you that uh, specific because I want you to see with from March that February 19 to March 19 is less than 30 days. So again, that is a dramatic reduction in her hemoglobin A1Cs, hemoglobin A1C, because so many 
uh, in that March number where it was 9.2, which is what we did last week with her endocrinologist, uh, many of the red blood cells that were floating around uh, in February and in January are still there. So it's not really a true check to see. In a few short weeks, we could drop her average sugars by going on a ketogenic diet. And really, the, at that stage of the game, the only thing we were doing was we were limiting carbs, and you did a good job of that, but you really were uh, very diligent about making sure you'd supplemented with exogenous ketones. We wanted that blood-brain barrier to get used to transporting that across, the, uh, across there into your brain, and we wanted your brain to get used to using it. You know, as you look inside a nutritional ketosis, um, I use this drawing to see that there are def there's red blood cells there. Now, these are not Lackland's red blood cells <laughs> because there's no little sticky sugars to them. Um, in a diabetic, those red blood cells would have just little stickiness, kind of think of it as extra sugar there. Um, you would also, you also do see though that the sugars um, are in about, yeah, kind of equal number to the ketones. Um, again, that's not a perfect representation, but I do this to show the difference between this and something called ketoacidosis, which Lachlan is a type 1 diabetic, so she is at risk for that. Uh, ketoacidosis, there would be hundreds of thousands of ketones, but there would also be hundreds of thousands of glucose uh, guys hanging out there too. So when you look throughout uh, ketoacidosis, people said, can't she go into ketoacidosis by taking that exogenous ketones? And I've said, no, no, that's not what happens. Um, it, it, your body's production of ketones goes into overdrive, um, specifically when insulin is is under, under supplemented, under used, or under available. Um, and in Lachlan, she is on a, she has her long acting uh, insulin. She is very well covered. And again, insulin is there to take glucose from those, from the circulation and put it into cells like muscle cells and um, muscle cells and liver cells and heart cells and eyeball cells, all, all the cells that need glucose. So this key part of the lesson, um, and I am doing it, this is Lachlan's first time of hearing this too. So I'm going to try to see if she grasps what I'm trying to put together here. So if you look at excess glucose floating around your body, the first thing that your body does with that is it binds it up with a bunch of friends. Um, so I put these glucose uh, in a bubble. Uh, really, it, they're in a, a vacuole inside the cell. And there are not just, a, you know, uh, yeah, I put a couple dozen in here, but there are uh, hundreds uh, of glucose uh, molecules put together. And this molecule is called glycogen. Um, and glycogen is really the fancy doctor word for stored glucose. Uh, specifically, we're putting that stored glucose inside your liver uh, and inside your muscle cells. So um, one, of the, one of the key problems with having really high sugars is the body will turn, it, it first will fill up the glycogen. Uh, it will make sure all these little glycogen bubbles are adequ adequately stored for anybody that might need energy in the next you know, a couple weeks. So if you look at, um, this is a muscle cell, it's actually, um, you know, when you look at how um, the mitochondria, which mitochondria are the furnace that are inside our cells. And when we use glucose uh, to fuel our furnaces, that energy goes way up and then it shoots way down. And <laughs> I have teenage boys that uh, have pushed back on being ketogenic recently. And so I let him have all the sugar he wanted. And then I told him he had to read for 20 minutes. And if he didn't fall asleep, then he, he, he could have sugar. Uh, but if he fell asleep when he was supposed to be reading, uh, then I win. And sh indeed, uh, I st <laughs> <laughs> he totally fell asleep and I win. Uh, because when you look at the crash that comes, I, I mean, I timed it <laughs> just perfectly, um, to say when you put sugar in your body, it does, it burns so quick. I compare it to a, a campfire where you light a bunch of leaves or pine needles and they burst up into flames and then they crash and it doesn't keep anybody warm that fire goes out it's it has to be restocked and that's where these kids and adults we s begin eating four or five six times a day um, you know it's only a little snack but what it does is ignite the chemistry that promotes diabetes 
So um, here's a muscle cell, and these, this mitochondria, um, these, it can't use the, the glycogen that's stored like this. The glycogen has to come outside of that little bubble, go into the mitochondria, and then poof out the energy to keep that cell alive. Um, the other place that there is a huge amount of storage um, uh, of glycogen is your liver. Your liver has um, such an abundant uh, capacity to store glycogen um, as well as fat. Um, one of the biggest dangers that Lachlan has in her uh, life journey is that her liver will become uh, hard and cirrhotic. Uh, cirrhosis of the liver is most commonly found not in my alcoholics, but in my uh, type, my diabetics who have just had too high of sugars for too long. Um, you add alcohol use to that and it's like adding fire to a problem, uh, you know, fuel to the fire of a problem. So when you look inside this, this uh, uh, liver, there's you know, probably per, per square inch of this liver, there's way more glycogen uh, bubbles filled with glucose uh, uh, as compared to the muscle cell that has a few, a few bubbles filled with glycogen. But when you look at the mass of our bodies, we actually store more glycogen in our muscles than we do in our liver because we only have one liver. Um, even though it can get quite large, it's never going to be the same mass as our muscle cells. Uh, we have an uh, incredible uh, volume of muscle cells that all put little storage bubbles in there. So the real question that we need to ask Lachlan tonight is, how old is your glycogen? So I bet you've never been, <laughs> been asked that, have you, Lachlan? <laughs> You're back. I back. never have. No. So how old is my glycogen? <laughs> Yeah, so if I could time your glycogen, that's what, what I would do to teach you about what happened with your sugars this week. Is that So last week I knew you were keto adapted and I was super excited. I said, you are gonna have weight loss this next month because the chemistry I can see shifting. And um, knowing that, and then, you know, I, I knew gluconeogenesis was gonna be part of our story, but I didn't actually think it would shoot your sugars up as high as they did. But what it tells me is uh, it's a really good thing we're doing this because those little glycogen bubbles that are inside your liver uh, have been there for a really long time. <laughs> like, have you ever made uh, something with brown sugar and that the, the brown sugar is so hard <laughs> that you have to like <laughs> hammer it to get it to yeah. come out of the bag, right? So that might be an example of what your glycogen bubbles look like. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so right? Really old. So yes, and we don't want old glycogen. We want, um, we want glycogen to have been fresh, to have been something recently needed. Um, and I think it's really valuable to say if you if you describe to folks over the last week what were your what were the number of carbs that you were taking in? It's less than twenty a day. For sure. The right? only I the only day I had more was last night when we went to Carnival. Oh yeah, yeah. That 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 place is amazing. Yeah, this is one of those uh, right. Brazilian. I mean, not much more, but you know. Right. This is a great choice. Good choice for going out, and you know, wonderful food, but. Uh, yeah. easy to slip over the 20 at that place, right? Right. No, the, the glycogen, um, uh, the glycogen, uh, coming out of, so she didn't put glucose in. She did a great job of respecting the evening hours of keeping the, the meal, you know, after that six or 7 PM, depending on kids schedules, really keeping it low. Um, and then you, you checked your sugars each morning. I'm going to go back to that slide that just shows your morning sugars to see what happened on um day on yeah the 14th so then that's when the the actually the 15th the third day where we were at uh insulin of 50 and your your glucose was back down to 155 in the morning your ketones were 0.3 um but again if you look at now you've gone 12 hours with nothing in your system and you still have a sugar of 155 that your body isn't getting the energy from ketones uh it's actually used up a lot of ketones uh and so what happened there why is there glucose floating around your system and the answer uh is your glucose had um uh ha you had you emptied a bunch of glycogen bubbles did you know you did that Woo -hoo! <laughs> <laughs> heck yeah i did right yeah you planned that yeah <laughs> that's what i'm trying to do this week right so <laughs> When, when you look, uh, you know, you, you Google some of the struggles with a ketogenic diet and folks will say things like, um, oh, gluconeogenesis is like a bad thing. Like we don't want your body making glucose. 
and I would say, no, 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 don't say, don't do that. Gluconeogenesis is the use of stored glucose, and especially in a type one diabetic, it is the cause of you know. When you look at my clinic uh, and you study the folks over 60 years old, they either all have diabetes or prediabetes, and they their bodies may say that they're 60 years old, but they've aged into their 90s, uh, and part of that is things like this. This glycogen is supposed to be used every day. You're supposed to empty that storage every day. And oh. your body chemistry wouldn't allow that because we were giving you excessive amounts of insulin to lower your glucose. That when you make, when you emptied those bubbles, the best news is, A, you reverse the age of some of those old crotchety muscles. <laughs> They're going to be younger now. Um, but you, all, you also, um, it took energy to fill them back up. So your body has to have these little glycogen bubbles around. And what looking at gluconeogenesis, one of the key things is, well, how old is your, how old is your glycogen? If it's only been there for a few hours because now you're going to go for a walk and your muscles are going to need energy, they're first going to use the glycogen. Um, when you're keto adapted, they will also use fat cells, um, triglycerides in your, in your muscles as well, but they first use glycogen. So what we, what the key is, we just don't want old storage of glycogen in your muscle cells. And as a diabetic, you kept adding and adding and adding to your um, storage of, of these, um, these old glucose molecules or old glycogen molecules in your, in your muscles and um, in your liver. So if I look at, you know, this picture just kind of shows a few very cute little uh, glycogen storage, but I would, I, I would put some, uh, some, you know, some old, you know, walking canes or some gray hair on those glycogens <laughs> because <laughs> they were probably really old. And we want those out of there. We want those replaced with fresh new sources of glycogen. So um, I know that it was frustrating to you uh, to have no to have some high sugars this past week, but um, I really do want you to know that I specifically um, have a great uh, excitement for you continuing um, where your your glucose is going. So Yay. so t so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a little teaching thing. So tell me what you think I just told you. Um. <laughs> <laughs> that my high blood sugar is a okay because my old glycogen was emptying out of my cirrhosis prone liver. Yes. <laughs> yes. Very good. So, I mean, it's real, honestly, uh, it's a good thing. I, I, I know that I, I'm going to make sure I go back to your numbers and just show off that they did get really nice by the end of the week. Um, you know, she had uh, that glucose down to 155, 160, and those ketones coming back up. And again, um, even though she had some, uh, went over her 20 carbs, so her glucose this morning was a little bit higher, that trend of increasing the ketones and um, you know, keeping that blood sugar down is a very big deal and I'm happy about it. So don't, don't have any negative animosity about that. So there are a couple other things that I wanted to, um, have you share with your, share with our audience. And that is that when you're on a ketogenic diet, there are some absolutes that happen to everybody. And one of them is that our magnesium gets low. Um, you've pro probably never thought about your magnesium. Have you? Me personally, no. Yeah, no. right. Most people are like, what is that? That sounds like, I don't know, something that goes in a battery. I don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> so when, when you look at magnesium, though, it is, um, it's a big part of how our body functions. And when we sh shift from a ketogenic diet or from a glucose dependent diet to a ketogenic diet, we do a lot of um, excessive flushing, especially when we lower our glucose. So we know that your average glucose, we don't quite know what it is going over the next um, probably six weeks. We'll check one of those A1Cs again. And I would bet that you're maybe even in the high sevens by now. So um, I'm super oh, excited yeah. to see. I know your, your endocrinologist is going to think we faked the labs, <laughs> but he's going to be like, take that again. That's not right. <laughs> Like, I can't be not that good. <laughs> like, <not here. laughs> but I really think it's going to be that good. So I'm going to put my heart on the line. But I know that when people, do, in, when they go from in that phase of keto adaption is when the magnesium flushes. And um, just to having, um, so I took you out for a treat um, saying, thanks for doing this. Thanks for being brave and coming on this channel and sharing this really vulnerable story with people. 
Um, so why don't you tell the people, first of all, tell them how I invited you and then tell them your first thoughts when you walked in that place. <laughs> and that sends me a text and it says, what are you doing at six o'clock? I have a surprise. Please tell me you're not busy. <laughs> You'll love it. <laughs> and then I get nervous. Right. right. The <laughs> saying, like, right. oh gosh, what am I signing myself up for here? I'm free. <laughs> <laughs> and our city was like flooded that day so it was like yeah we what our city was flooded that day so partially it was uh how yeah. you know how are we gonna you know we're all sitting at homes like nobody's that busy <laughs> so i kind right, of set you right. up a little bit <laughs> right so annette treated me to a float spa and it was amazing <laughs> mm -hmm. so describe to folks what what's in a float spa um a whole bunch of Epsom salt, right? Yeah. So yeah. It, you walk in, like but it looks- Like 1,200 pounds or something? Yes, it, it, it is. It's very dense or high salinity, high, high salt uh, in this water. And so um, you go in your birthday suit. You can go in a swimsuit, but you go in your birthday suit. You're in this little pod, this private pod. And um, t tell about your experience. What, did, what happened when you were in the pod? Like tell- You're like- completely weightless in there so and it's dark and it's just you and your thoughts and being weightless it's like you're in mm -hmm. outer space happiness floating around you can like stretch a lot but the water is very strange because you can't like lift off of it but at the same time you can't go under it right i tried to drown myself a couple times because i just wanted to know what was going to happen if i fell asleep and like your face literally won't go under the water. It's amazing, isn't it? Like it's, it's so such weird. a strange thing to try to explain to somebody. <laughs> but you know, so after about, you know, I, I had no idea. Like once we shut the lights off and went in there, then I was like, oh, I forgot to ask her how long I'm going to be in here. So I just had like no concept of time or how long I was going to be in there or what was going to happen. So um, I think it took me a good while to just untense though. Oh, it's a, yeah. I think because you're just so used to like, I got to like pay attention when I'm on water to not drown that mm -hmm. you just naturally are tense. That shutdown so is not as easy as it sounds. Once I realized I wasn't going to drown, there was no chance of drowning. Like mm. relaxation. Mm. Like I told you when I got out, I planned the rest of my life. <laughs> I got some things figured out. <laughs> no, it's a big deal. Like I can't awesome. tell you how big of a fan I, I mean, in the, when I wrote my book, uh, any way you can, I talk about Epsom salt and how powerful that is in a bathtub. But if, if you do the calculation for the amount of improvement in your magnesium in one hour in one of these floats, it's like 12 to 15 hours in a bathtub. I'm like, that's my kind of fix. Oh, wow. I know, right? So it's a big uh, shift in not just the, um, not just the, um, the therapy of timeouts in our world today that's so busy, um, so filled with noise and input that I think of it as a sensory reset um but it was something where i i can't i can't express to the audience how thankful i am for your uh, willingness to do this journey um oh. it, it has been uh, a huge um uh, blessing to to use this teachable moment but also to to really engage in your health and say let's just show the world that you know if lackland can do this anybody can do this <laughs> she has you know 15 balls in the air and she has type 1 diabetes she does not make any insulin and um, your lessons have just rippled through the community. So I just can't tell you how grateful it is that people have um, poured into to paying attention to your story. Um, I do have a, a really special thing that I want to do for Lachlan um, that uh, she doesn't know about. Um, and that is um, Lachlan, is, <laughs> yeah, she's scared again. <laughs> um, she is a hairdresser and she is my hairdresser too. Um, and has uh, done several things in the world of um, not just uh, promoting, um, uh, you know, helping me with my hair, but also uh, she she does uh, sell her products on her line, on her um, um, in her salon, but also online. And 
Um, I don't ask uh, folks to do, um, uh, to, I don't solicit a lot of products or a lot of things on this channel. I really am here about the science, but I could not do this without the patients um, being willing to step forth. And especially Lachlan's story, uh, the first few weeks she had to deal with a major death in her life and, you know, putting forth that uh, emotional trauma while I'm trying to get her to eat better. And oh, by the way, let's go live in front of, I don't know, 120,000 people on my channel. Um, I just can't tell you how grateful I am. And so uh, she volunteers to do this. I treated her to that magnesium because I'm trying to say thank you, but she is a single mom and she's out there doing this for you to learn. And I would just encourage people that everybody needs shampoo everybody needs hair products um uh, even if you I are bald you wash your hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you have, right and i just want to generously thank lachlan for her her ability to be on this channel and be so vulnerable about something like type 1 diabetes and a ketogenic diet um, so I would, I put your website up on the, on the um, bottom of the screen. And I just would mm -hmm. say if anybody out there is thankful for what Lachlan has been doing, um, I, um, I would ask you to show support to Lachlan by buying products from her website. Um, you know, it is, um, it is a, such a generous heart for her to be here. And I just want to do my part to say, how can I genuinely thank her? And I'll tell you, she's a single mom. I mean, two kids, teenagers, they have, I have three, I have three, I have a foreign exchange student. I'm telling you, they're very <laughs> expensive at this stage. And, um, right. you know, there's, uh, there's nothing like um, the stress of that added to how we, you know, kind of take hold of our lives and say, how can we improve something like blood sugar when you're a type one diabetic? And you know the extreme situations that a type one type one diabetic allows me to teach uh, is how it, it makes it even easier for the rest of the world to to learn about. You know, gluconeogenesis is something that is a niche part of a ketogenic diet, and the athletes are out there saying, "But I need glu I need glycogen I need glucose to fuel my my muscles." And so there's this tiny little part of the ketogenic world that talks about this, and I would say that no, 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 the people that need to be talking about it are chronically uh, inflamed uh, type two and type one diabetics. Mm -hmm. And the reason we care is Did because you say I'm not an athlete. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> uh, Whatever. <laughs> yeah. So they do these amazing uh, limitations of their glucose and their numbers. And they, they type me and they text me these long pages saying, this is hacked. Something's wrong. My blood sugar is high. How can it be above 100? I didn't eat a stinking carb the whole day. And I just want to show them what a glycogen bubble is. And I, I say, the real answer here is, how old is your glycogen? And so I just think your, your case for the last week does a great job for those people that are stuck in a plateau. And if they're not looking at both the blood glucose and the blood ketones, this is gonna be very difficult for them to figure out. But um, your story, once again, does a great job of helping us um, learn. So, all right. Well, thank you for all of your help because mm -hmm. I'm telling you guys, you gotta have like a, a Dr. Boz in your corner because this week, if I wouldn't have been, you know, encouraged by Annette to say, it's okay, it's okay. I, I, the old me would have gave up. <laughs> right? Well, 260, that's so not fair. That's but like now that my brain is burning ketones, I made a level-headed decision. And I said, right. Lachlan, don't stop. <laughs> Yes. So uh, last week we talked a little bit about uh, taking that uh, ketone shake down to, uh, we limited the shake, right? That's what we did this past week? Yep. Mm -hmm. And how'd that go? Totally fine. I was expecting to probably be trying to eat a hand or something by the time it was launched, but I was totally fine. So you did have more hunger? No, yeah. I just did my coffee with a little bit of um, heavy whipping cream in it. Mm-hmm. And so, then I was good to go until lunch. So you were worried okay. about being hungry. That's what you were saying. Yes. Oh, yes. see, and that's that's the difference. The reason I did not decrease your dose uh, from two to, to a day until last week is because I wanted you keto adapted. I needed to see the shift in your numbers to say, oh, look, she's keto adapted. She's making her own morning ketones at a steady level. And we had a couple of those low sugars because you're, you had too high of insulin. So it was a tipping point last week where I'm like, okay, it's going to be safe. We'll drop the numbers. Her brain should not get foggy or crabby, uh, even if it gets disappointed, <laughs> but <laughs> it shouldn't geek out. <laughs> and, and you should be able to lower that uh, supplement to once a day. 
So I'm very thankful that. So let's uh, just make a plan for the, this week. And then I have another show that starts in about 12 minutes. So okay. I, um, I would like you to keep doing the one shake a day. And again, the, the highest amount of respect for that uh, calorie uh, free zone from, um, you know, 6.30, depend, 6 to 7, whenever the kids kind of get tied together. But the longer you can uh, limit the uh, uh, the calories going in after that 6 or 7 p.m. at night. Um, you know, the other thing I've had uh, my type 1s do is if they do have to eat late, I have them try to really not eat in the morning until they feel hungry. Um, it, it is a, you know, even, the, you know, I have them push to black coffee. Something else I've been uh, playing with are the, uh, there's some fasting teas that I put in the show notes that I've really become a fan of. I'm going to have to bring you some samples of that, Lachlan. You'll love it. I love my tea. Yeah, right? Well, these are really interesting teas. I'll explain those on a different day, but I've just been a big fan. So um, they're in the show oh. notes for anybody that cares. But the key thing for her is if she does have a late meal um, that's past that seven o'clock, it really is best for her liver and her muscle cells if she gets it before that but if it's late then we want you to say try not to put any calories in in the morning black coffee uh, um, you know uh, tea without any extras in it until you feel hunger and then eat a full meal okay 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 I can do it all right <laughs> got any questions for me um I'm sure I'll have something for you by Wednesday at okay. the salon <laughs> awesome. Perfect. I'll see you then. I've got some gray hairs coming your way. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Bye-bye. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody. I'm signing off as Dr. Boz. Thank you again for dialing in. And once again, I can't tell you how thankful I am uh, that Lachlan is willing to step forth and do this. This is her Instagram handle. So if you want to give her a shout out of just encouragement or if you have any questions about the products that are on her page for, for uh, hair products, um, I don't solicit a lot of things here. There's two guests that have been near and dear to my heart, um, and they are the patients that are giving their time and energy to teach you. Uh, one of them is Lachlan, and the other one is Jennifer Marie. Uh, you'll see another playlist about her and really supporting her cookbook that she put out. Uh, it's not out yet, but she's uh, doing pre-sales right now, so you'll see that in the show notes as well. I'm signing off as Dr. Bosworth, helping you with your health one ketone at a time. Good night.